Hello. It's a pleasure to work, welcome you all to an event of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, West Cumbria area, but of course available all around the world. I'm John Foster, one of the local area committee members, and I'm here to introduce our webinar speaker, Tim Wilmshurst, who is near Derby this evening and who I first got to know 6,000 miles from Cumbria in a country called Botswana. Our local area puts on talks and industrial visits roughly once a month. It also does outreach to schools and colleges promoting engineering as a career. We are currently developing a set of project challenges that we hope will stimulate interest among students in secondary schools. As engineers, we all know that the vast majority of significant projects are multidisciplinary. For any project team to innovate and succeed, it needs to make good use of the widest relevant range of technologies. So it's good to bring the Internet of Things to the mechanical engineers of West Cumbria. Before I hand over to Tim, let me tell you that the plan for this evening is for Tim to speak for about half an hour, during which time you, the audience, are encouraged to type in any questions that occur to you, and there will be a box visible to you labeled, Ask a Question. After Tim's presentation is complete, then it will be the turn of your questions, which I shall select in some sort of order and shall read out for Tim to respond to. A recording of the webinar will be available through your login link by the beginning of next week. Now about Tim. Our speaker, Tim Wilmshurst, has made designing systems with embedded digital control his speciality. In his career, his work has ranged from scientific instrument systems through industrial systems using microcontrollers to drone design, and more recently, multiple applications of the ARM embed. He has been a design engineer or a leading academic in three universities, Cambridge, Derby, and the University of Botswana. He has written at least four books on embedded systems. I checked. Beyond electronics and software, he's very interested in the whole process of engineering design, so he understands the place of mechanical engineering in the overall system design and proto prototyping. He's now a freelance engineering educator and technical author, and he manages to fit in being a very good violinist as well. So, Tim, we're now ready to hear what you want to say, and I'm going to mute. Thanks very much for your kind words, John, and it's very nice to be here, uh, at least virtually, in the beautiful West Cumbria area. And I'm just trying to persuade these slides to go forward, which they're not doing for me at the moment. Yes, OK. Good, thanks very much, OK. So, um, Yes, we're, we're looking at the Internet of Things, and in particular, we're, we're looking at designing the things for the Internet of Things. So without more ado, let's have a look at our uh, agenda, which is shown here. I'm just going to overview what the IoT is. And then under four headings, we will look at some opportunities and challenges. We, we've got a big topic tonight, so, so we're just sneaking around and trying to get a glimpse of some of these. And if in the process, uh, those who, who are perhaps more mechanically oriented can think that they uh, are able to engage with IoT design or applications, then that will have been a good thing. I am aware that I'm a member of the IET, speaking to people who are from the IMECI, and I appreciate that. Uh, and then after those four headings, we'll, we'll have a conclusion and we'll see where we get to after that. So what is the Internet of Things? Uh, a term used to describe a world in which devices or things communicate directly with each other through the Internet, maybe arriving at decisions, actions and processes without human intervention. And this is a big change because the Internet, as originally conceived, was uh, designed for human use, uh, maybe people to access information or communicate with each other, 
and the IoT has thrown challenges to all of us, uh, not least to actually the concept of the internet itself. And there are various uh, terminologies which are thrown around, the ones there in, in italics, machine to a machine, industrial IoT, and they're all kind of variations of the same wider concept. And in that blue box down there, Glenn Lurie makes a very stark uh, statement to anybody who's designing or, or, or thinking about producing devices. Any device that is connected is smart. Any device that is not connected is dumb. So there's a warning to us all who are designing things. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, so we've got a little IoT model here. Uh, and at the middle, it's a very simple sort of model, at the, at the middle we've got the, the so-called cloud itself, this massive interconnected network of fabulous processing power and data storage, uh, which we can access through various intermediaries. Uh, my interest tonight is the things at the periphery of the diagram, those little cylinders which I've labeled things, and, and what those things are will emerge in the coming slides. But they are devices which are smart by the Lurie definition. They will be connected to the internet. They will have rather limited communication capability, most of them. So in general, they'll go through what we're calling a gateway, something which will interface between them and the net, the, the internet. Uh, a few Things might be internet enabled directly, so have direct access. Uh, and top right, some things may group and, and gateways may group into local area networks and so on. So, so there's lots of configurations uh, whereby the things that we're talking about can communicate with the cloud. And these are example fields of IoT application. Uh, top left, that's a picture of the house I'm sitting in, actually. And, and we can make a house into a smart house. All the appliances we have in the kitchen and elsewhere, the fridge, the cooker, the microwave, and so on, can be rendered smart, can connect with each other, can connect with their suppliers, with the people who fix them with the people who use them, the homeowners. And similarly, the entertainment system, the, the air conditioning, the climate control, and very significantly, the household security can be connected together. And we have a smart home. If we move top right, smart buildings, we, we extend the concept of the smart home, but we might be talking about a very big building now. One may be used as, as a workplace, multi-occupancy, much more complex use, but some of our interests are the same and some of them extend on what we've already mentioned. Bottom left, there's lots of talk about smart cars. The modern motor vehicle, of course, is a very sophisticated network in itself and it can connect back to the internet. And if we combine all of those things together, bottom right, uh, we have the smart city where we can have uh, pervasive broadband giving us traffic control, control of public transport, uh, monitoring of infrastructure, control of emergency services, energy flow, and so on. And, and many major cities, Singapore a good example, are actively striving towards this already. And then central, we have smart health either individuals who are uh, wishing to monitor their own health and, and, and keep it good, or people who are being treated uh, by health professionals who are maybe providing data back to a hospital or a clinic or something like that. So many applications. And here are some things. <laughs> Um, and I've deliberately chosen very familiar uh, little clip art uh, images here. Things do not have to be clever, sort of sophisticated devices. They may be, they may be, but um, 
A diagram we didn't have in the previous slide is smart farming. Uh, and that is a big application of uh, IoT. So let's look at the cow. Top right there, we can fit the cow, the cattle, the livestock with uh, biochip transponders, if we wish. We can monitor locally, field by field, what's going on uh, cli climatically and, and soil um, humidity and so on. And then to the left of the diagram, we, we have those personal devices, health monitoring and so on. In the middle, we may have devices which are, which are domestic. And towards the right, we have items of merchandise which might be moving around, they're being tracked, uh, and there are little tags on those which might form part of a much larger network. So what are the essentials of an IoT thing? Uh, there's a little list here, and then there's a block diagram. We've, we've mentioned that we want them to be smart. That will means that they're probably under intelligent, in inverted commas, control, a microcontroller, a microprocessor. And we want to make a lot of these things. We want, want to be able to distribute them widely. Uh, so we want them to be small, comparatively simple, probably low data rate, almost certainly low cost, and we don't want wires trailing around. So we want them to be wireless linked and to be low power so that they can be battery powered or uh, powered from uh, energy harvesting. And the block diagram that we can take is, is shown there. At the middle, we'll have some control and data processing, probably a microcontroller, one or more sensor sensors, uh, possibly an actuator or more, some interface electronics over to the right, a wireless link driven by uh, some more interface control and, and probably some data processing in there. And then we're going to have a source of energy and we're going to process that energy. Uh, and that's going to be provided to, to the thing that we've got there. Okay, that, that was my little IoT overview. Uh, now going forward to these headings under opportunities and challenges. Uh, and I'm going to look at function scale and cost. It's a very wide ranging heading in itself. And here's a nice example from a company called Net Clearance. Um, and it's shown next to an AA battery there. Uh, very, very small, 15 millimeters by 20 millimeters. And to the right, we have it enlarged somewhat. And what we're told there is that it can sense temperature, vibration, acceleration, magnetic fields, and light. And that's amazing. Uh, and if we look at that image to the right, we don't see anything that looks like a light sensor or an accelerometer. But it's all there and it's embedded within the um, devices that we're looking at. And we're going to talk a little bit about sensors. Uh, so by all means, explore this device. Other similar ones, there's the company Net Clearance. Uh, very interesting what they're doing in this field. And, and how is all of that possible? Uh, for a number of reasons. One reason is that electronics has been extraordinarily miniaturized and, and horizontal axis here we've got time vertical axis we've got number of transistors uh, integrated onto a single ic a single chip as people sometimes say and it was gordon moore who created a law it's not a law at all it's an observation that the number of transistors in general that we've been able to fabricate onto a single integrated circuit doubles approximately every two years. And that's not going to go on forever. We're almost at the limit of it there. Um, and if you look at this slide, you might not be able to read the small print, that doesn't matter. It's the trend that matters. If you've been rattling around for a while like I have, you'll see some of your career there because you'll see devices you worked with back in the day 10, 20, 30 years ago and uh, recognize that they have become superseded by others. 
And little outliers there, the ones lying below the main line, happen to be arm devices. <laughs> you might say, oh, poor old arm, they're not catching up. Uh, the opposite is true. Arm's great strength has been doing more with less. They design very efficient CPU cores. So they're keeping up with the pack, uh, but doing it with fewer transistors, and that's been one of their great strengths. And to the right there, we see visually a little tiny PIC microcontroller, more computationally powerful than the computer that landed the first man on the moon. Uh, and it is so very small. And that has the CPU, the memory, data memory, and loads of peripherals or some peripherals. So electronics has collapsed in size. And alongside that, it's become loads cheaper and it's become loads more sophisticated and uh, powerful. And in parallel with that, sensors have been reducing in size in a quite dramatic way. Uh, first advantage is that semiconductor material itself is susceptible to light, temperature and strain. So we can immediately make sensors to, to measure those variables uh, with, without great effort. Just expose a bit of semiconductor to the light and you, you've got a light sensor of some sort. Much more dramatic, and it's been with us for over 20 years, is the concept of MEMS microelectromechanical system sensors. Uh, and, and one is pictured there, and these are sensors that are actually fabricated within the semiconductor by etching techniques that we use anyway in fabricating the integrated circuit. And we can make these little tiny mechanical devices. And that is an extraordinary achievement. And there, if you look at that diagram, you, you, you've got left and right two, two vertical members with a little fin sticking out. And then in the middle, imagine that middle uh, thing vibrating backwards and forwards, and it will vary the capacitance between the plates formed by the stationary fin and the moving fin. And we've got an accelerometer on our hands, and, and that's really pretty good. Uh, and we can do other forms of uh, sensors, wide range of sensors with MEMS, and also ultrasound, Hall effect to sense magnetic fields and hence current, piezoelectric, these sensors have all diminished incredibly in size. So we get subsystems like this. This is a, uh, an accelerometer from analog devices. Uh, pictured to the right, really develops primarily initially for airbag um, actuation to sense uh, a motor vehicle stopping very, very quickly. Uh, and what we've got is a MEMS uh, accelerometer, pictured left, and then on the same IC, we, we've got sense electronics, analog to digital converter, uh, digital filter, and then we've got the digital interface so that that subsystem can interface directly with a microcontroller, and we've got the power management as well. And it's a very small and it's really very low cost, and integrated sensors like this are available to us, and um, they're very, very powerful. So if we look at the modern motor vehicle, we see the most astonishing array of sensors in use. And these are of all different types from engine management, brake control, uh, door locks, climate control within the vehicle, fuel level, lights, and so on and so on. You can see them there. And the, the, the plethora of sensors that we're now able to use is wonderful. So we have this combination of um, very small, very sophisticated electronics with very readily available small sensors, all of them low cost, and they're all at our fingertips. So that's pretty good. And what we said is we want this to be low power. We want our things to be low power. So just a little tiny bit of electronics, electrical engineering in, in the slides coming up, very straightforward. 
if we have a target system, we're, we're powering it from a battery, uh, it's drawing a certain current. The power that's delivered is volts times amps, C times I. And the energy that's transferred is power times time in joules. OK, and those little images to the right of various forms of battery. There are petrol tanks, aren't they? There are stores of energy and they're going to very cautiously give up their energy to uh, supply our things, our devices that we're developing. But it's not going to be as simple as just connecting a battery. What we're going to do is we're going to vary uh, in most things, most devices, we're going to vary the power flow according to how active the device is, and we may be putting it into very low power modes at different times. So this diagram is intended to represent a device which switches between two power levels, P1 and P2. And while it's at P1, that's a duration of time T1, so the energy consumed is now P1 T2 plus P2. T2 and so on if there are other uh, energy, uh, power consumption levels. And then we can find average powers and, and that is useful to us. So if we're using batteries, we, we want a sort of fit and forget approach to this. And you see rattling around people talking about, yeah, I want to operate for one year or five years or seven years without a battery change. How long do you expect your wristwatch uh, to go without changing the battery? A, a, a really remarkably long time. So uh, uh, again, a little bit of electronics at the top of this slide. And um, don't worry about that at all if you're not familiar with it. The purpose is just to represent the very important fact that in digital electronics, when we're using Complementary metal oxide semiconductor, CMOS. Your phone, your laptop is stuffed full of CMOS devices. It, it's, it's the technology we use. What happens is that the logic gates within your laptop, within your phone, they only take power when there is a transition, a logic transition from zero to one or one to zero. Uh, if they're sitting still, the power consumption is very, very low. So there's a, an equation in the middle of the slide. The total current is equal to uh, IQ. That's a quiescent current. It's very, very small. Almost ignore it. Plus your supply voltage times your operating frequency times a capacitance value. I've just called that distributed capacitance value. You're not going to be able to control that much. The two things you can control maybe are your supply voltage and probably your operating frequency. So for a given circuit, just looking at the statement at the bottom, current flow is minimized with lowest possible supply voltage and lowest possible operating frequency. We're going to call it the clock frequency. This is an absolute mantra for low power designers. And what we must remember when we're designing low power IoT things. So there's a little street map which um, we can apply. We're going to supply energy, we're going to consume energy. We could supply from a battery or from the mains or from renewable or energy harvesting. And we're going to consume it and we're going to play various tricks to minimize that energy consumption. So we're going to use the lowest low power electronics technology that will minimize that distributed capacitance term, which I mentioned in the previous slide. And then we really have two sets of tricks in our toolbox, manipulating voltage and manipulating uh, clock frequency. Of course, we want to mi minimize the supply voltage. Little health warning, as you reduce your supply voltage, your circuit may deteriorate in its performance. Frankly, it'll stop working if you take the voltage too low. But, but you, you can be quite skillful in, in running at a minimum. Or you, you can divide up your circuit and you can power down locally 
bits of it that you don't need at any one moment. And regarding clock, the, the simple thing would be to say, well, I'm choosing a frequency, hoping for the best and letting it run. Uh, or you can apply what we call sleep modes. And we'll do an example on this in a moment. Um, and this is any modern microcontroller and, and a lot of other digital circuits allow you to switch the clock off to parts of the circuit that you're not using. So you're not powering down, you're not losing data, um, but you are depriving that part of the circuit of the clock. It stops working, uh, but it retains data. And you could wake up every minute if you need to take a bunch of measurements, uh, or you could have an event-driven wake up where you you, you wake up when somebody pushes a button or when an external event happens or a piece of data comes in. Or you can have what I've called ad hoc sleep, which is snatching moments of sleep for the microcontroller almost instantaneously when there's not a lot going on. Um, and this is done in, in for example, the ARM uh, most recent operating system. They're very good at doing that. So we have those options, those opportunities, as we design our IoT things to give us low power. And we're going into an example here, and, and I'm choosing um, an LPC 1768. It doesn't matter to Hoots if you've never heard of that. It's a certain microcontroller. It's made by NXP. It happens to have an ARM core. Um, what matters, what is of interest, is, is that for any device, any microcontroller particularly, we can look up its um, current consumption figures, and these are really important to us. So this device has to have a 3.3 volt supply, so we're not going to be allowed to mess around with the supply voltage. But here we go, if we're running at 12 megahertz, um, we're going to consume seven milliamps approx. Take that up to 100 meg, we're gonna consume 42 milliamps and up we go. And look at the bottom four lines, and those are quite big currents in electronic terms. If we enter what is called sleep mode, we consume two milliamps, still quite a lot, okay? A lot of the microcontroller is still active. We go into deep sleep, we're shutting off more uh, subsystems within the microcontroller, so we're expecting less stuff to happen in this mode. Or we could go to power down, or we could go to deep power down. And 630 nanoamps is a tiny current. That, that's exciting to low power designers. And what we're doing is we're keeping the real time clock running, uh, and this is a, a seconds, minutes, hours. Um, clock inside the microcontroller, which allows us to uh, set an alarm clock effectively and wake up when we need to do stuff. So we have this palette of opportunities, of, of operating modes, of power consumption. And let's do a few sums. So we're going to use an LPC 1768 uh, running at 12 megahertz, and we're going to have it waking up every minute to make a bunch of measurements, which we're going to transmit, and that process is going to take 100 milliseconds. And otherwise, we're in deep sleep. Okay, I'm keeping this simple, so I'm just doing the sums for the microcontroller. Of course, we'll have other devices, the wireless transmitter, things like that, but we can play a similar game with them. We can put them into sleep and so on. So I'm popping back to the previous slide. We're running at 12 megahertz, so seven milliamps when we're awake and doing stuff, sorry, and 240 microamps when we're asleep and not doing much. Okay, so what's our average current? Um, well, every minute we're waking up. So in 60 seconds, 59.9, uh, seconds, we're going to be in that deep sleep mode. So 59.9 times 0.24, I'm doing a weighted average, plus seven, which is our seven milliamps, 
uh, my awake current times 0.1, my 100 milliseconds. Add that up, divide it all by 60, and that will give me an average current. And there it is, 251 milliamp, uh, microamps. Okay, does that number just fall from the sky? No, it's quite closely related to the 240 microamps we had for our sleep. And what it's interesting to, to observe is, although we woke up and were very busy, we were busy for a very short time. And that average current is strongly influenced by the sleep current. And of course, the activity pushes us up a bit beyond the 240 microamps that we had. Average power, 829 microwatts. Okay, we'll, we'll bear that number in mind because we will actually come back to it. Um, and we can then say, OK, our triple A's have uh, a nominal life of 1175 milliamp hours. So let's do that calculation. Uh, that gives 4,600 hours or 195 days of operation. Is it good? It's not fantastic. Uh, or if we use our button cells, that's 26 days. We can reflect on that. Um, they're not great, OK, a lot better than we used to have. Um, but if we want to get five years from the button cells, we would have to drop to an average current of 3.6 microamps. Is that doable? Well, it might be doable, remembering those figures, if we can really exploit that deep power down mode. OK, so we'd have to go back to the drawing board and think about that. Or we could select a less powerful microcontroller whose current consumption was a bit less. But it's this sort of arithmetic we want to do um, while we're doing our designs. So we've talked a lot about batteries and uh, they're incredibly useful to us and technology is always improving. But we have the opportunity for renewables and the opportunity for what we're now calling energy harvesting. I, I would really refer to it as micro energy harvesting. And the wonderful thing is we're surrounded by energy from light, vibration, flow, motion, etc., magnetic fields, EM radiation. And if we're clever, we can grab some of this very <laughs> small value energy and perhaps accumulate it and use it and spare ourselves the battery power or, or reduce the, 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 the load on the battery. So this is, this is a, a nice Fujitsu Im image. And I would recommend, if you're interested in this, looking at the Fujitsu website, they're, they're very active in this field. And the next slide is from another very interesting company in all of this, Sinbert. Have a look at that as well. And they're putting a scale of energy consumption up to power tools, OK, 100 watts, down to microprocessor standby. You could relate that to the numbers we were looking at. Remember our average power? That was 898 microwatts, if I remember rightly, so just below a milliwatt. So we would be sat within what they're calling their energy harvesting sweet spot, i.e. they're suggesting it would be possible to power the device we had from um, uh, an energy harvesting application. How do we do this? Well, back to Fujitsu. Um, and they, they have a range of products and, and EPs is one. And we're just looking at one of their images here. and. This device, uh, it can connect to a very small solar panel. OK, these are not big panels that you put on your roof. Uh, and, and they're claiming that you can do this with light inside a building. It's not sunlight. It's much feebler uh, light bulb light inside a room. And they're offering these devices which allow you to manage your batteries, rechargeable or otherwise. Uh, and to supply power at a couple of different voltages to your application. So there is a way forward there for you. So we're moving on to our 
third heading here, wireless connectivity. Uh, and again, it's, it's a wide field. Uh, and we're going to need many different solutions to many different needs. Uh, so we sometimes give different scales, different names, personal area network, uh, stuff you have on you or very close to you, local area network within a small building, neighborhood area network, wide area network with, with possible scales shown there. Um, we will need different solutions for different scales depending upon the range, the data rates, our concerns about security and things like that. So we've got the radio spectrum to at our fingertips as it were. Uh, different wireless frequencies offer slightly different properties. Uh, lower frequencies might have better penetration through walls and, and give a slightly longer distance range. Uh, higher frequencies will offer smaller antennae, um, more, more data um, being able to be carried and so on. And of course, we don't have a free choice at all because we are uh, under very strict licensing control. Uh, but we have at least one frequency, 2.4 gigahertz, which is reserved worldwide for ISM, industrial scientific medical applications. And we can transmit in that frequency uh, completely legally, and we do. Uh, there are other frequencies available to us. I'm not mentioning them in this country, uh, but some of those you'll find in other countries. They are different. So there's a little bit more complexity there. Um, we need to consider the physical manifestation of what we're doing. Big aerials or little aerials sat on uh, printed circuit boards or, or tiny aerials, which are just tracks on printed circuit boards or buried inside a, a USB connected device. Uh, so there's lots to think about. Um, and there are a number of protocols, protocols being this, a set of rules uh, which defines how one particular uh, standard of wireless communication is going to be transmitted and received so that transmitter and receiver understand each other and so on. Vertical axis, data rate, horizontal axis range. Uh, there we have our old friend Wi-Fi, we use it every day. and cellular, we use that every day. Lower down and, and sort of in the hundreds kilobits per second and below, we have protocols which are of greater interest for IoT things. Uh, things like Zigbee, I'm going to mention that, uh, low power wide area network and so on. So we, we can look at this, if, if we know our data rate, if we know our range, we can begin to hone in on a protocol which might be of interest to us, might be useful to us. And we won't go through all of these. You can look them up or you can look at the slides. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are things that we use in our daily lives in a fairly straightforward way, very common to us. Uh, protocols which are more specialist to us, uh, and some examples appear in this slide, there, there are more than, than are shown here. I'm going to talk a little bit about Zigbee and look at that targeted at low data, low power, low cost, long sleep intervals, powered by coin cells, extensive networks, everything we're likely to want in our uh, IoT um, environment. And then down at the bottom, uh, we, we have a protocol which is low power, wide area. So, so that's more for distance applications. And if we just home in on Zigbee, just to get a feel for this, um, there are three devices within Zigbee. Uh, an end device is the little device which does the work, it does the measurements, very simple, and it passes back data. And the simplest network is, is shown down there. Uh, 
it's just a pair, the coordinator, uh, to an end device. We can have a single coordinator and a bunch of end devices, or very cleverly, we can introduce a device called the router. Uh, so we remain with a single coordinator, but routers can uh, connect to the end device and transmit data on. So in a building, for example, we might have a single coordinator, a router per floor, and on each floor, a number of end devices connecting to that router, all those routers then connecting down to uh, the single coordinator. And by so doing, we should be able to uh, instrument up uh, a whole building if we wanted to. So this, this diagram offers or shows some of the possibilities on offer. We can have our things hooked together either in mesh or in star, and they will be communicating back to the gateway, uh, Zigbee, Bluetooth, or Bluetooth low power. Um, and then the gateway will be communicating to the cloud, maybe by cell connection or via a local area network, and then uh, back to the wider internet. And here we have a nice example of Zigbee in a medical application. Um, top left, we, we, we've got a single individual at home, but wearing uh, sensors, one or more, which is Zigbee enabled and can communicate back to a coordinator and a gateway fitted in the home. And then that connects back to the internet. In, in the larger box below, we're, we're in a hospital or care home, and then we might have multiple residents or patients, uh, some or all of whom might be wearing sensors, which is Zigbee enabled, back to a coordinator, back to a gateway, um, through to the internet. And healthcare providers, of course, monitoring all of this. So you might say it's not pure IoT, there are people involved, but it's a nice example of uh, Zigbee systems, a Zigbee-based system. So we're just going to briefly visit uh, standards and security, um, and I've called that an aside on security because it's a huge topic, but we need to be aware of it. And you may have seen this example a year or two back, a light bulb, a smart light bulb. Seems such a neat idea to Philips, uh, but it left a smart home vulnerable to being hacked. And you can look at the scenario down there. Um, the attacker disturbs the light bulb in some way, and the controller then perceives that the bulb is faulty. It thinks it's, it will disconnect and try reconnecting, but when it reconnects, it reconnects to um, a bulb which the hacker has provided. Um, and it rejoins the IoT network. And then that hacked bulb can bombard the controller, it can overload the controller, um, which then loses control, and the, the, the hacker can move within the system by uh, these sorts of processes. And, and you can read out the detail of this. This is, this is just an overview. Um, so very clearly, We've got to be very cautious with uh, security in the IoT. And it's the simple devices which are the most vulnerable. Don't think just because you're measuring temperature that uh, you're not going to be vulnerable to hacking if you're connecting to the internet. You, you've, you've got to be aware of it. And once they're given access to the system that the, the hacker is in, uh, so we need all system elements to be secure. The hackers will identify and target the weakest. And the horror scenario, I think if your home was hacked, your car was hacked, the havoc that could be wreaked. So there's an organization called OWASP. It's an interesting website to visit. Um, and every year or so, they identify the top 10 security challenges for the IoT. And 2018, they had this list, 
Um, and, you know, just glance at one or two and, and, and they are, some are very obvious and things we're concerned about all the time. Uh, some of them are uh, a little bit less so, but if our password is weak or guessable or whatever, how often we hear about that. Lack of device management, we throw something away. We might at that moment be, be giving away important secrets and, and, and information. Lack of physical hardenings. Can somebody approach our device and unscrew the cover and um, you know, gain access to it in that way? There are so many different ways that a system can be hacked. So that brings me to the end. And I'm sorry it's been more 40 minutes than 30 minutes or 42. But the conclusions are simple. The IoT is here. Uh, already impacting on daily life and there's lots more to come and for we who are designers who, who, who work in different fields of engineering or across disciplinary boundaries we, we have huge opportunities and they're lovely opportunities uh, we, we have such power now available to us with small devices low power low cost we can do many things there are challenges managing the security of the energy supply, uh, the flow of data, and so on. Uh, but let's go for it. There, there's lots of interesting things we can do. I hand back to you, John. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much indeed for that. And uh, it was very comprehensive and uh, given us a lot to think about. Um, I'm hoping that uh, it'll generate some questions, but nothing has appeared in my uh, attention box yet so I'm going to bowl you one on my own Go for it. Um, try for it um, I can remember back in the time when um, solar panels and PV arrays uh, first began to appear so sort of at road size you'd see you'd see a, a PV um, array which is maybe count powering a counter or and connected to a um, a device at yes. some place, yeah. roads. Everyone hoped there was a source of energy in remote areas. Um, it seemed that nobody had thought about the fact that these PV arrays and the batteries would actually be attractive to thieves. Um, is the inter Internet of Things going to make it possible that so small, su such small powers are being used? that uh, it'll no longer be attractive to, to that sort of um, criminality? Well, thanks for the question. I, I think it's really interesting because anything that we can power from renewables is, is attractive. Um, I, I think always stuff that you leave outside, you have to um, make as secure as possible. Uh, I think what is important is to, is to consider what sort of power you're intending to deliver and consume and if you if you've got a display board which is trying to uh display information to people flashing past you know on a motorway in on a road um you're using power at a much higher level than if you've got a, a, a tiny little device waking up and occasionally measuring temperature and humidity or something like that so I don't think the IoT is going to change um, roadside devices such as you describe. Um, I think we still want those. We need to make them secure. Um, it may be able to track them when they're stolen. That, that might be a possibility. And of course, we are forever um, improving solar panels and improving energy consumption characteristics of devices so so we're taking less power but but in terms of your example i think the iot is coming in in parallel and offering a new range of devices uh which, which are much smaller than what you describe um and which can probably therefore be hidden rather better and made rather more inaccessible right um We've got a question from uh, Jim Infield. And unfortunately, I'm finding it difficult to open the question. Oh, yes, here we go. All right, so I can read this. This, this is what Jim says. 
with billions of devices all on the same query frequency, how is this managed to avoid confusion between these devices and their gateways? Are there any other scaling issues? So shall I read that again? Or no, no, that, 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 that's really good, really important, really fundamental. Um, so imagine your airport um, waiting room full of 200 people and each person's got a mobile phone and they're using Bluetooth. Why isn't there complete mayhem breaking out? Um, and the Bluetooth designers and the, the Zigbee designers um, have sort of got hold of this. Um, and they're using a technique called spread spectrum, which used to be used and is still used for security. Uh, so high security communications. Um, so what the frequency is doing uh, as the Bluetooth signal communicates, and the Zigbee as well, is it's hopping around. So it's sitting close to the base frequency, let's say 2.4 gigahertz, but um, it's hopping around. And when the Bluetooth devices pair, and you'll be familiar with, with um, a Bluetooth device announcing that it's paired, then they have got the key to follow each other. And then they're hopping in uh, harmony with each other. And alongside them, there might be a lot of other devices hopping around, but they're hopping in different patterns. So if they occasionally clash, um, the, the, any single Bluetooth link can recover from that. Um, but that clash is momentary. Uh, and the other secret, of course, is that the transmission is low power. So um, it, it, it doesn't go that far. Uh, but but it's 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 really through spread spread spectrum technology that that it is possible. That's great. Um, thank you, thank you, Tim. Um, there's a a greeting from Alan Odero, um, who is at a Nango Solar Limited. Oh. And he says it's not really a question, but an appreciation to Tim for the presentation. Lots of interesting concerns to address in designing IoT devices and also provided websites where we can refer to. Thank you, Festus. And uh, this name will ring a bell for you. Yeah, Jonas Foss. And uh, hello, Jonas. Because it's great to hear from you. Um, and I see that you're at Malmo University. Malmo is a place which is dear to my heart because um, I've had several relatives in the um, either side of the bridge, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to renewing contact with you. But thanks for thanks for that. You said it reminds you of the best seven years of your life at the Botswana <laughs> Polytechnic. Botswana <laughs> Polytechnic X, X's will be happy with that. Um, I've got a question coming up from David Willem. Today we have a choice on whether to embrace smart technology. Do you think there will be a time when having a smart home is mandatory? Who won't be able to live without it? <laughs> Big Brother will be watching. <laughs> Any comments, Tim? Well, I, I think that's an interesting philosophical and technical question because there, there, there are already incentives uh, if we talk about smart metering of our electrical power. Then the company, electrical supply company, might want to control our fridges, our washing machines, our heavy users of electrical energy, so that they can remotely uh, power them on during the night, or you know, for half an hour, switch off our, our fridge. If, if there's been um, if there's a peak building up on the the supply, so that if you switch off ten thousand fridges, you know you, you you begin to reduce your supply load. Um, so mandatory, I, I kind of hope not, but um, I, I I don't think so. I, I think you know we we will have freedom to do what we want, but I think there will be societal and economic pressures maybe to um, go with the flow and, and just as in the pandemic we're currently in the poor high street is collapsing it's because we're 
sitting on our computers buying things. And there are other equivalents in the smart home where, where we engage with, with needs that we have in, in a different way. But mandatory, I don't know. Okay, so I've got another one from Jonas. It seems like many systems use use UPS as uninterruptible power supplies. I, I think microprocessors. Power, uh, I have a feeling power consumption can be reduced if less capable UPSs are used in many applications. Any comments on this? Yeah, the, the, there's a lot of stuff being written now about where you do your data processing. Do, do you make your IoT thing really pretty dumb? Do you use a very, very simple 8-bit microcontroller with fabulously low um, power consumption and then transfer the data away and let some other part of the system worry about how it's powered, uh, sorry, how it's processed? Uh, but there's also a move to, to have data processed locally so that you're not demanding bandwidth upstream in order to transmit masses of data which maybe you don't need if, you, if you've averaged it or, or done something more clever with it. Um, so certainly we, we can get the most extraordinary low power with our IoT things by keeping them really, really simple. Uh, and that may be the way forward that there's the whole concept of doing computing on the edge. So that's not in the IoT thing, but it, it's in the, the gateway device, which might be mains powered, so you're not worrying about battery there. And you do a fair bit of data processing there. And then what you upload is um, a much less um, you know, bandwidth hungry version of, of the measurement that you've made. Good. All right. So now um, I think we're getting to the uh, point where no no other questions are appearing, and I'm just wondering if I can squeeze in another one of my own, which yeah, is sort of local it. to where. All right. Uh, just about the first slide that you showed showed a uh, a rather well set up cow, <laughs> and the <laughs> livestock. Um, so that they can communicate with the system. Can you tell us what this might do for animal husbandry in an agricultural country, county, such as Cumbria? My observation to start you with is that catching a herd weak sheep to change a battery could be pretty tricky. <laughs> well, you're gonna catch your sheep to shear them and that would be the moment to change the battery. Um, I expect the data rate, if, if you've got transponders on animals, and, and hey, in Botswana, we've had transponders on elephants for years, um, but that would not be a high data rate, but that reinforces the point that, that, that you don't want power-hungry things. Um, what, what, what's the question about? What's the impact on, on animal care? You, you can you yep. can track your sheep in the Lake District as they go roaming all over the fells. Uh, you can track basics about their health as well. I would imagine temperature, uh, other sort of indicators of health. Uh, similar things Good. with with cattle. Thanks on this one. Now we've got something from uh, ooh. Yeah, Bureau Veritas UK, Joe McCusker has uh, brought the question, is there a danger that a lot of things are being developed in silos? Will interoperability be an issue? Yeah, th thanks for that, because that opens the, the, the bigger issue. And uh, it, it is an issue and for, for lots of reasons. But um, a lot of these standards, you know, I've talked about Zigbee, Zigbee's developed quite fast. These protocols that we use, um, they're changing fast. One of the security threats in the list of 10 was that you could be using legacy equipment, which is not updated to the most recent protocol, for example. Um, 
so you you th there is a problem and different companies need to keep working together and what is interesting is um standards like zigbee and others are actually configured by consortia of companies who are working together to um keep keep them the same to to so that everybody's you know singing from the same hymn sheet as it were uh so it is an issue it it is something to be very aware of uh to be tracking developments in, in all standards and protocols and trying to keep you know current with with what is going on oh thank you tim um i'm just going to read out one greeting from uh chedi caravu and then the last question will be from Jim Infield, and I think we will stop at that point. Um, in any case, in case somebody is thinking of uh, leaving the session now, can I uh, remind IMECE members that there is on the 21st of uh, January, there is a, a presentation about the air ambulance jet. So um, that might be of interest to some people, 21st of January. Uh, Chetty says, congratulations for the presentation. Unfortunately, our internet, and this may be Botswana internet, I'm afraid, uh, has been poor throughout the talk. It was on and off. Um, so oh. the last question is Jim Infield. Uh, that's interesting. He's an applications and usability engineer, and he says, given the huge benefits, what is the holdup? There's the last poser for you, Tim. What is no, well, well, perhaps the two last quest questions or comments uh, give a bit of the answer. That there's poor old Chedi sitting there with an unreliable internet. That's that's quite bad news. And uh, Joe asking about um, compatibility between different systems and systems being developed in silos and so on. Um, I, I think it's in trying to return to the question. It's the sheer scale of the change. Um, which is both the technical change and perhaps the behavioural change that it is expected of us. And, you know, back to smart meters in the home, they've had a rollout and then there's been a, a reaction against them because they haven't um, pleased people in, in the way they thought they would be uh, and so on. So I think progress is being made pretty fast and it's being made in, in many situations I, i've barely mentioned industrial applications which is possibly where where it is being most systematically taken up um and in the home we we, we can be much more cavalier about whether we want to engage with this technology or not uh, a company which needs to compete uh will will be much more active about um keeping abreast of, of technological offerings um, so I think we're going pretty fast. Uh, devices are being developed, technologies are being developed, stuff is being taken up. It's beyond that, perhaps economic, you know, um, providing the funds needed to, to, to keep up the changes. They, they are such big changes. Well, I think it's just for me to wish everybody, wherever they are, um, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And look forward to meeting several of you again, possibly if if uh, this sort of webinar continues. So thank you very much, everybody who's attended. And um, good night. Yeah, thank you very much, John. Thank you, everybody.